Hi, my name's Starsky and welcome to From the Studio on Clubbing TV. A few weeks ago, I demoed the Analog Solutions Fusebox, a big, beautiful, orange, analog synth. And in this episode, I'm gonna look at a big, beautiful, orange, digital synth. It's the Waldorf Microwave XT. This has become a bit of a digital classic. I see it for sale for well over a thousand pounds and unlike lots of digital synths, it's never really lost its value since its release. I think it was in 1998. Most digital synths went through a sort of a very lonely phase where nobody wanted them. And they just seemed to fade into the background, collecting dust at the back of old shoe cupboards or hiding among unwanted old toys and stuffed in boxes between long forgotten random bags of old Lego. Everyone started to long for smooth analog sounds and digital aliasing and all those harsh tones were yesterday's news. But this little beast was never apologetic about its sound. In fact, it reveled in its digital ancestry, even including wavetables from the earliest of the pioneering PPG wave synths, which I think were the very first commercial wavetable synths. So this took things a little bit further with its digital filter, other things may have digital wavetables, but analog filters, but this is definitely digital <laughs> all the way through. But unlike cheap digital synths, that sounded bad because they couldn't sound any better, basically. This takes the 8-bit digital waveforms, puts them through a couple of digital filters, but most importantly, this has got an amazingly comprehensive modulation section, and all this means it can create really complex tones that huge modular systems would have difficulty reproducing, and combine that with the digital sounds, and you've got yourself a, a classic which has never really lost its potency, and why the prices have never really dropped even when most digital synths had gone out of fashion. Now this is the 10 voice version and there is a 30 voice version because it's eight part multi-timbral. So with 30 voices, you can pretty much do a whole track on its own. Although I've found that it's such a distinctive sound, you never really want to use more than one or two. So on the back here, we've got two main outputs. We've also got a stereo analog in, so we can bring other sounds through this crunchy digital filter, plus MIDI in through and out. But let's start by taking a look at its main functions. And we'll start by just going through the interface because that'll give us a really good idea of what we've got. So over here on the left, we've got oscillator one and oscillator two, and they're both wavetable oscillators. And I'll look at those in a bit more detail in a minute. But here we can choose the start wave and the envelope amount. And that's to do with moving through the wavetables. Again, we'll talk about that when I, when I come to the oscillators. Then we've got a mixer. We can mix the two waves here. We've got ring modulation between them, plus we've got a noise source. And that brings us over to the filter. And we've got this big, nice red knob for the cutoff there. And we've got different types of filter. And then we come to the modulation section. And this is really flexible on the synth. And even though this has got all these knobs, they don't really do the modulation section justice. And the best way to show you that will be on an editor. So let's take a look at the oscillators. And we'll start by initializing the patch. So I've initialized the patch. Now we've got a tone with no modulation and that's generated using wavetables. And what a wavetable is, it's just a snapshot of a single cycle of a wave that you might get on anything. So any sound you get, you just sample it down to a single cycle. And here's another editor, and this is showing you all the different waves we've got in each wavetable. So this is wavetable one, and there we've got the different waves in that. So go into wavetable 14, that clipper one we've just seen. So the first one's really inharmonic, and as we move through the wavetable, we go to those nice sort of sinusoid-looking smooth ones in the middle. And then back to the really harmonic ones again. So hopefully that explains what a wavetable is.
and you can hear with that sound there we're moving through the wave tables but we've also got those sort of weird horrible horrible little sort of digital artifacts in there but they're what give it its character not many synths can do stuff like this let's find something else as well shall we <laughs> Again, you can hear we're moving through the wavetables, got some nice sort of modulation happening. But you don't just make really sort of nice lush sounds with this, it's really good for sort of FM style basses. So you can hear loads of really weird aliasing, digital artifacts and nasty stuff in there, but that's what gives it its character. That's not bad, that's good. <laughs> So unlike a lot of things that will try and hide the digital character, this has actually got parameters to help bring them out. If you want aliasing, you've got five levels of aliasing. If you want time quantizing, you've got five different levels of that. You've, got, you've still got your analog slop, but you've also got this digital overflowing saturation, which is disgusting. It's great. So completely different set of oscillators that you'll find on most synths. Another nice little touch is the randomization function, and it randomizes all the parameters. So you can end up with something really strange and ethereal, like some really odd alien soundscape, and you can end up with something that's just horrifically disgusting. So let's have a little play with that. That one's actually scaring me. Stick that through a decent reverb, and you got yourself a whole horror film soundtrack in one, in one patch. So let's move over to the filter now. Again, the filter is an all digital affair. It's got various types. It's got low pass and band pass 24 dB, 12 dB. It's got a high pass filter in there. It's got a separate high pass filter, a little 6 dB one there for getting rid of sort of horrible little rumbles. It's got a wave shaping filter. It's got a sine filter. It's got an FM filter. It's got a sample and hold filter. It's got a notch filter, so it's uh, really flexible from that standpoint. Let's have a listen to some of them. Sort of what you'd expect from a low pass filter. It's a bit, bit rough and ready, but it's nice. This is an odd one. This is the sample and hold filter. Bit weird, but quite like it. It sounds a bit like someone spent hours and hours setting something up on a modular rig. Let's have a listen to the FM one, shall we? I could mess around with that for hours. You can get some really disgusting rises and drops from it. And when I first got this, I wasn't looking for something that had a weird digital filter and strange oscillators, but I was looking for something a little bit different. Uh, and I'd asked the shop, I want something that doesn't sound like a standard virtual analog. And they sort of threw this at me and said, off you go, you'll be happy with that. And, and I was, <laughs> it's really, really good. Let's take a listen to some more tones, shall we? So 
there's loads of lovely stuff in there. And as I say, it's all been helped along by this modulation matrix it's got inside it. So best way to look at that is on an app. So let's take a look at that using the Monstrum editor. We've got 16 different slots, got all these different sources with all these various destinations. So that's quite complex in itself when you change the modulation amount using these sliders over on the right. But then down here, we've got these other modifiers which are modulation sources themselves. So if we go to here, for example, I could pick modifier one. And modifier one's got two separate sources, for example. And then we've got various ways of adding or subtracting those two signals. So you've got exclusive ors and ors, multiplication, subtraction, all sorts of madness. And that's what makes it so flexible. You've got these sort of ever evolving tones you can get from it as it sweeps through the waves in all sorts of different ways. And we can even change the waves as well. We can create our own waves. This editor will help you draw them in as well. I wish I had the time to go through all these functions separately and show you exactly how they all affect the tone, but that would literally take me days. But hopefully you're getting a feel for why this is such a classic digital synth. But is it for you? Looking at alternatives, from a hardware perspective, there's always the other microwaves from Waldorf. They don't have the knobby interface this has got. In fact, the microwave 2 is essentially this from here upward, so it doesn't have all these lovely handy knobs at the bottom. All you have is this matrix here to root through, which is, which is pretty difficult. Then, of course, there's the Waldorf's, like the Blofeld, which is, I say new, but it's been out for a few years now, but you can buy it new. It's got 25 voices with wavetables on two of the oscillators. I've not played with the recent Korg mod wave yet. It's only just been announced, which is a wavetable synth that I'll, I'll try and get hold of for a future episode. And, of course, there's always software like the Nave from Waldorf, which is available on tablet or as a VST plugin. And then, of course, there's the couple of sort of huge famous wavetable based synths like Native Instruments Massive and of course Serum and these both rely on the wavetables to get that really distinct harsh tone they're so sort of famous for but nothing sounds quite like the original microwaves so I hope that answered some of your questions you might have about wavetable synths what they do what's the why are they different to normal synths and if you did don't forget you can catch it whenever you like on our Clubbing TV official YouTube channel on the From the Studio playlist. And if you've got any questions, drop them in the comments and I'll see what I can do to answer them. And if you're into music tech, don't forget you can check out my Starsky Car YouTube channel as well, where I've got a lot more in-depth and technical reviews of basic bits of kit for the studio. So I'll see you in the next episode of From the Studio.